Hello folks, welcome to another edition of Inside the Marble Palace, Saskatchewan Post Media's look at the goings-on of the Saskatchewan Legislature and politics in general in this province. I am Murray Mandrick, political columnist for the Regina Leader Post, Saskatoon Star Phoenix. With me as always, Jeremy Symes, our reporter for the Star Phoenix and Leader Post covering the legislature, and senior reporter at CGME Rocco Radio in Regina, Lisa Schick. Thank you so much. She covers politics. She does a great job. She asks amazing questions. And uh, I'm so glad to have you back on this uh, uh, on this podcast. Lisa, thanks for joining us. Yeah, glad to be here. Jeremy, let's start with you. Health care. There's a lot going on. And if we listen to uh, Premier Scott Moe, Health Minister Paul Merriman, there is a sense of normality that we get from them that we don't necessarily hear from Sun, from the Saskatchewan Union of Nurses, from doctors, from others. Although one of the big problems is we're not hearing much from doctors and nurses right now. Can you explain the whole scenario from the perspective of what government is telling us that's going on and what other people are telling us is going on with hospitals? So let's start with maybe what doctors, nurses, and, and others are saying is the precise problem in Saskatchewan hospitals right now. Yeah, for sure. Lots of different messaging happening right now, but starting with doctors and nurses, they're saying the, go the government's response to COVID right now is not matching kind of the reality that that's out there. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of burnout. We're seeing uh, hospitalizations take a toll and people are coming in, they're sick. On top of that, you have other people needing surgeries and they can't get them done because the hospitals are so busy right now and they're still very busy. So I think it's fair to argue that, you know, COVID has kind of come back in the spotlight in a way. We're seeing a lot more of it right now and we're seeing doctors and nurses raise those those concerns. Now, with the government, they're acknowledging this. Health Minister Paul Merriman says, you know, there are some challenges right now, but he keeps saying we are in a stable position and that our overall capacity is, we're not over capacity overall throughout the health system. That's not the case in Saskatoon right now, where we're seeing the hospital there at over capacity. We're seeing a lot of issues uh, with people getting access to healthcare, waiting in ERs and that sort of thing. And this really played out at the legislature this week, uh, particularly on the surgical side. We saw the Dooley family come in and express their concerns. They ha he hasn't, Brennan hasn't been able to get brain surgery for about two years now, and it was really hard to watch. And they just, they were looking for some compassion. They want some answers. The government is saying they have a plan. They're gonna bring more ER doctors into the province. They're gonna have that recruitment and training, but, Again, kind of the answer right now from the health minister is go get your booster shot so you don't have to end up in the hospital. I don't think there's much they can do in the short term right now to address this pressure. It's it's just one of those things that this is the situation we're in and they're looking long term to maybe fix, fix it. Lisa, you've been covering this for the entire two years of the pandemic, which has included going to what were once the weekly press conferences held by Dr. Shahab that we are no longer hearing. A week ago, we heard from Dr. Shahab. Uh, we are again getting weekly updates on COVID-19 uh, in terms of at least hospitalizations and death figures. Although I don't know if we're going to hear from Dr. Shahab today, this being the Thursday before the uh, Easter long weekend. We live as reporters on the margins in terms of what is news in the sense that the government tries to make messaging consistent, but we can often tell when it's not. Why I love reporters like you is because you always drill down into that area and and, and ask the good questions that make the difference. So I, I guess I'd like to hear your perspective in terms of what is changed that you've seen in terms of what government tells you versus maybe what they were saying a year ago or two two years ago about how relatively open they were. What's the biggest difference when uh, we're asking questions right now in terms of what government is telling us uh, two years ago uh, and a year ago and what they're telling us now, uh, specifically in terms of the timely information uh, that we used to get with the weekly updates that we're no longer getting? Well, really, it's it's night and day from when the pandemic started two years ago to now. I mean, in the very beginning, 
we were getting almost daily updates, I think, daily press conferences uh, with numbers, with information about, you know, what's coming, what the situation is right now, both when it comes to cases, when it comes to the virus, when it comes to what's actually happening in hospitals. Uh, right now, we're getting weekly numbers, that it's some numbers, uh, some of those numbers are a week old by the time that you get them. Uh, some of them have context, some of them don't. It's hard to compare Saskatchewan to other provinces in the country because we don't have the same kind of information that they do. And we don't have those uh, daily briefings anymore. We had them daily, then we had them weekly. Uh, now we can get the health minister sometimes after QP when it's not in sitting. It's a bit tougher to get him. It's a bit tougher to get the premier. Uh, it's certainly tougher to get uh, Dr. Shahab. I think we went a month, a month and a half without being able to speak to him. And it just makes it more difficult to know what is happening in the province with COVID. I mean, I know they say that the case numbers really don't tell you anything anymore because there are so many cases that aren't counted because of rapid tests. People don't report those rapid tests. But it's still difficult to say how things are going in the province without having that information and certainly without being able to uh, do comparisons with what it's been like in other parts of the country. What do you, what do you sense, Lisa, in terms of feedback? Because it, Different newsrooms experience different frustrations, but I know one of the frustrations we have in our in our newspaper newsroom is people can't we can't really explain to people why they're not getting the information that they need. They, they're requesting more, and it seems to be counterbalanced with a lot of people basically saying, "I'm tired of hearing bad news about COVID. I'm tired of hearing." Uh, all this negative stuff on a daily basis. It's time to move on, which I think in essence is what the government is somewhat messaging. Are you experiencing that same feedback from listeners in your newsroom, Lisa? Absolutely. It's, it's very much a separation. There are those people on the one side who say, I don't want to hear anything about COVID anymore. It, it's been too much, but it's two years. I'm done with it. Then there are the other people who they're saying, you know, I need this information to be able to make decisions for my family. You know, either they might be immune compromised, they might have a child who's unvaccinated, they might have a grandparent who they like to visit and they feel like they need that information to know if it's safe to go out, if it's safe to be around their loved ones. And like you say, certainly the government seems to be trying to get into that situation where not as much information isn't a big deal. Uh, they've talked about uh, wanting to start treating COVID like other communicable diseases. And, you know, uh, we were gone to this uh, once every week information. They had been talking about going to every month, but it seems like that's not happening for a while yet. Uh, and th this isn't the same as any other communicable disease, though, certainly. And uh, it, it's interesting that they're trying to treat it like that, even though there are some people who, who don't want to treat it like that. Jeremy, I think where the rubber hits the road is in specific areas. It's obviously a problem in hospitals where we've had stories this week about hallway medicine, not just hallway room medicine, waiting room medicine. And I can't imagine wandering into a hospital and being treated in a waiting room and, and how terrible that must be for, for patients. We've also heard stories from uh, the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation, where they're pushing for masking uh, restrictions to be returned to schools if appropriate, because we're seeing some classrooms, I guess, in uh, and not an infrequent number, a large number of classrooms where they're talking about 10% absenteeism. Uh, you know, that happened in my high school for other reasons, but usually it was on a Friday. You know, it, 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 it's not really a great thing right now in terms of this. What is the government's response to, uh, to, to this and how are they handling that reality as per, uh, I think what Lisa's saying, in terms of just, in essence, trying not to overplay, in some cases downplay the whole situation. What was, for instance, Dustin Duncan, education minister's response to the masking request, I think came from uh, both the opposition and certainly the Saskatchewan Te Teachers Federation this week. Right, so the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation came out this week saying, you know, we want mandatory masks in schools, on our buses, and in extracurricular activities. They want isolation requirements, uh, increased transparency on data sharing, and just more reporting to the public so parents can make those better decisions. They also want access to PCR testing for teachers and all um, student-facing school staff. And they just want the education sector to come together and reconvene and plan so that 
they can manage this thing again because I think they are teachers like doctors are are very burned out right now. The response from government, I know Health Minister Paul Merriman was asked about this, about the STFs request, and they're not going to bring in masks. They're not going to do this mandatory thing anymore. And I think they they just want to stick to their guns on their original decision that we are we got rid of mandates because we don't want this divide from people anymore, and um, it, it's time to live with COVID. And at the same time, while they're saying that they don't want people to mask shame, they're saying if you wear a mask, that's fine. Please don't you know be upset with someone for wearing a mask. They're telling parents like if you want your kids to wear a mask, to, you know, get them to wear a mask. So. That's the response right now. It's putting it on the individual. It's putting the onus on the person to make their own decisions. Now, the counter argument to that, obviously, is we don't see the daily data from the government on COVID numbers. So people don't really have much to go off of. They can go off the weekly stuff, like Lisa mentioned. But again, that's also a week old. It's not up to date and current information. So they're really relying on older information and making their decisions on that, which I don't think people who want to do that uh, feel like that's the best approach. Lisa, you broadcast all over the province. Do you see big differences in, say, schools in Saskatoon or in Regina or rural Saskatchewan in terms of the response to this? I, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of whether the concern about COVID in, in various areas, whether it be schools or hospitals, but let's focus on schools, I guess, for a moment, is isolated to where there seems to be COVID hotspots, and right now Saskatoon, for instance, seems to be one, or if you get a sense that from the response that you're getting and from what you're covering, that there's more of a general problem in in, in the province. Do you see, I guess what I'm asking you is, do you see the government having more support for its policies in certain cities or in certain areas of the province than it does in others? I I definitely think there's um, like maybe a city rural divide in that situation because uh, throughout the pandemic, certainly now, even at the beginning, uh, there was less of a concern generally uh, in rural areas when it came to COVID, um, a bit more discontent when it came to some of the mandates. And a lot of that had to do with the fact uh, certainly early on, um, even now, there wasn't a lot of COVID in those rural areas. There might be an outbreak, a bunch of cases for a little while, and then soon there would be nobody that anybody knew had COVID. So they're thinking, you know, why do we have these mandates? Why do I have to wear a mask? Why do I have to show proof of vaccination if I want to go into the coffee shop? Um, in cities, th there are more people, there's more COVID. You have more people that you're coming in contact with that you don't necessarily know where they've been. So uh, certainly what we've heard, what I've heard is a lot more concern on that front in cities. There's so much to talk about. I wish we could almost spend the whole podcast on this one, but there, there are a whole bunch of other issues I'd love to touch on before we leave. So I'm gonna start with another one, Jeremy. I want you to care about this issue because I'm, I'm not sure who doesn't. The Premier said, I don't care in relation to an issue related to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and per capita uh, emissions. Explain, I guess, two things to me. The, uh, the context of how he said that and what he said, and I guess perhaps maybe what he was intending to say uh, versus how it came across because it was a considerable controversy almost more so outside the legislature, oddly enough, than inside the legislature, uh, mm -hmm. because he didn't ask, answer questions inside the legislature. Tell me about the context of the I don't care comment he made roughly a week ago to the, uh, to the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce in Prince Albert. For sure. So yeah, he was in PA and just bear with me, I'm gonna read the entire quote because that's yes. what Mo did to us. He was like, I need to give you the context here. So. He told the PA, or sorry, the SAS Chamber of Commerce, a lot of folks will come to me and say, hey, you guys have the highest carbon emissions per capita. I don't care. And then he want, went on to say, we have the highest exports per cap, exports per capita in Canada as well. We make the cleanest products and then we send it over to 150 countries around the world. This province is most certainly a part of the solution when it comes to a cleaner, greener economy. So... We see him saying, I don't care to this per capita emissions figure, I guess you could say. And he called that figure ridiculous and it has no bearing on reality. And I think the argument he was trying to make was 
yes, we make all these products in Saskatchewan. And yes, perhaps we have the highest per capita emissions because of that. We contribute about 10% emissions overall to Canada. But Saskatchewan isn't consuming all of those products here. We make them, but they get sent out and they get consumed elsewhere. So we're not actually consuming all these emissions that I guess we create, that there's like more after effects after that. He also said you have to take into account that we are the highest exporter per capita as well. So of course our per capita emissions will be higher if we're exporting per capita more as well. I know that sounds yeah. maybe confusing, convoluted, but that's the argument he was trying to make. And you know, we asked, he he did mention, he's like, maybe I could have rephrased this better. And I was like, okay, well, how would you rephrase it? He said, well, I'll stand by the I don't care comment for now. Um, <laughs> could have I been less controversial potentially? So obviously this got people particularly on social media, climate activists, pretty upset about it. He was asked about it in the House. The NDP criticized saying, you know, when you make these comments, you are hurting investor confidence. And we heard from Emily Eaton, a climate activist, a professor at the, the University of Regina saying, you know, this was a really candid moment for Mo, and it just really shows that they don't care about climate change in the province. Lisa, you were in the scrum as well as, well as Jeremy and I, and I don't personally, I didn't sense much contrition uh, from the premier in terms of what he said, as, as Jeremy, I think, explained. I did sense that he felt a need to elaborate and explain his position uh, a little bit more in detail. The question I'm kind of wondering right now is because of that, how do you think it's playing out for the government right now? Because I think there's a lot of people out there in Saskatchewan who kind of agree with his sentiment that I don't care about this particular issue. We are we are in Saskatchewan, which is the highest uh, uh, producers of, uh, of, of, of of various uh, farming commodities, be it wheat, uh, you know, oil seeds, etc. That require this. We certainly produce more potash and are more than our share of oil and gas. Uh, does it play to once again that? The vision that you spoke about earlier in the province related to COVID uh, in Saskatchewan and where it might play a little bit better in certain sectors, particularly in the rural areas where they're producing these commodities versus maybe in the cities where you might have people with more, as Jeremy just suggested, environmental concerns? Well, in the scrum, he was asked, like, point blank, do you think we should reduce emissions? And he said, yes, we should, and then continued on kind of explaining around his comment. but. I, I don't know that it's a huge surprise that he said this. I mean, the question of whether the SAS party government uh, is worried about climate change, wants to reduce emissions, that's been a question for a long time. And I think what he said, it will do well with the people who support him and who agree with him, but the people who don't support him, who don't agree with that, who think we should be doing more on climate change, I, I don't think it's going to be a surprise to them. I don't think that this is going to be an, a big aha moment uh, because that's been a question for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Jeremy, we're kind of just past the halfway point of this spring sitting. Uh, we're, it's a spring sitting in which we're seeing uh, in the background an NDP leadership race. We had uh, a second candidate and Caitlin Harvey enter the race uh, for the NDP, so it's now actually a race. Uh, we've had a whole Ooh. bunch of other issues, including Bill 70. In your mind, what do you see is things that were that you, you're finding surprising about this session that maybe are highlights that people aren't talking about? What is it that, that struck you that's really registering uh, for the opposition this particular session that uh, that uh, uh, that people might not immediately think of when we talk about the usual issues like climate and COVID and other issues? That's a really good question. Uh, I think what has been sticking out to me, and I don't know if this is surprising to people, but it is the the healthcare stuff. It's bringing in people from rural communities talking about their hospitals being temporarily closed. It's people coming in and saying, we are haven't been able to get surgery for two years. I think these are issues they can be strong in and they're really playing up in a way and it's having an effect. You can tell the government does really care about these issues too. And they do want to take them seriously. So I think that's where the NDP has been really strong is, you know, bringing up the, the hospitals in rural Saskatchewan being uh, temporarily shuttered and uh, having people come in for surgeries. And other issues, I'm not entirely sure. Um, 
I think education is one to watch because we have these budgets coming down from a bunch of schools. They're going to come in June and we're going to see the fallout of that. So that might become something that becomes a lot more interesting that we'll see. Honestly, uh, I guess aside from the I don't care comment from Mo, we haven't seen much talk about climate change. Um, on the Bill 70 stuff, you know, it gets rehashed over and over again, but I don't know if it's really making an impact. I don't know how much the public kind of really cares about it, to be completely honest with you. So, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with health care and, yeah. and, and hospitals. Yeah, it's fascinating. What about you, Lisa? What have you seen as sort of the hits and misses for government in particular this session uh, that maybe get a little less attention than obviously the COVID situation that we still are talking about ad nauseum. Uh, is there something that's, that struck you in terms of, of, of things that you've been covering that uh, are a little bit more surprising than you thought they would be? You know, it's spring, so spring budget. Yeah. Um, and it, it certainly, there were a few things in there that, that were interesting that I guess not exactly surprising. It's it's not an election year, so we're not going to get any any big juicy items. But uh, the PST expansion oh, yeah. was yeah. certainly interesting. I mean, uh, there's a lot of reaction at that about that right at first. I think we're going to see a lot more in the fall when it actually comes into effect and people are buying rider tickets, people are buying hockey tickets, and they're seeing it on their bill. Um, the the small business tax uh, kind of going back to. Um, gradually, I guess, back to what it was before the pandemic. It's been kind of under the radar, but I'm seeing reaction on that from small business owners because they already feel like uh, government hasn't really done as much as they could have during the pandemic, and they're still really struggling. I wish we had more time this week to talk about uh, uh, about all the things going on because there has been, once again, so much. It seems that way every week. Uh, Jeremy, Lisa, thank you so much uh, for for doing this. Thanks for, for covering so much ground in, in, in such a short period because there has been a lot going on. And hopefully we'll see you both again sometime soon on Inside the Marble Palace.